So today I want to spend a little time talking about gene linkage, meaning genes that are likely to be inherited together. So as you see here, A and B are more likely to be inherited together than A and E or B and E. So why is that? Well, it's because of this process known as crossing over, which is going to mix up genes that are on the same chromosome. So this happens during meiosis one. So uh, the replication of DNA has already happened and the tetrads are close together, those homologous chromosomes. And so you can see the legs of these chromosomes can form crosses and those crosses are called chismata. And so, after those chismata form, when they resolve during the rest of meiosis one, you get this cross where the chromosome that was inherited from this person's maternal line and paternal line are now fused into one recombinant chromosome. So let's look at these chromosomes as gametes, as haploid gametes. So if there's no recombination, these are the only combinations of A, B, and E you would get. So all dominant or all recessive. But if recombination has happened, you'll see that there are some parental gametes, but there are also some gametes with new combinations, introducing variation into potential future offspring. So what we see with linkage is basically we are breaking the law of independent assortment where this is an exception to the law of independent assortment because under the law of independent assortment with a test cross like this where one parent is heterozygous for two traits and then you've got one parent that is recessive for both, that's kind of the definition of a test cross, you would get this very simple dihybrid cross because the recessive parent could only have one particular type of gamete. And so you would see a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. But what if what you observe isn't a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio? And basically, how will you know? How will you test for linkage? Well, this is when we bring in our chi-square test to apply to this problem and see if what we observe is a good fit to what we expect. And if it's not, then there may be some other inheritance pattern like linkage at play. So going back to our old example with these parents, I'm just going to abbreviate the phenotypes um, with the dominant or the recessive letters. So those are not genotypes, even though they look like the gamete genotypes. So if you're looking at the offspring phenotypes, we have a couple of experiments here. Our total in the first experiment is 50. Our total in the second experiment is 100. But what we really care about in a linkage question is the parent phenotypes versus the recombinant phenotypes. So you'll see I've organized my table so that the parent phenotypes are together um, and the recombinant phenotypes are together. Total those up and you're ready now to apply the chi-square. So let's try a chi-square with those numbers. So we have our parentals and our recombinants for our two experiments, one with a total of 50. So the expected values are 25 and 25 because you would expect parental and recombinant phenotypes to be half and half if it's a one to one to one to one ratio. And for the other, we have 50 expected for each. So my question to you is, for this, what are the degrees of freedom that you would use for this chi-square problem? You can use that to calculate your critical value of your chi-square. And what chi-square values do you get for these two experiments? So go ahead and pause. So since you only have two groups, parental and recombinant, your degrees of freedom is one. That means a critical value at a alpha of 0.05, your critical value will be 3.84. When you go ahead and plug those observed and expected values into O minus E squared over E, here's what you get. 
So for the first experiment, 2.88. And for the second, remember, always take the sum of both. Sometimes I see students only giving me half of that number, which could be really important to your results. Um, always do the sum. And so with the 2.88, that is less than 3.84. So we did not find enough difference between the observed and expected values to reject our null. So we fail to reject our null. That means no linkage. Parent and recombinant values appear to be fairly similar to the expected. With our experiment that involved 100 individuals, which look at this, it just so happens to be double the other number. So sometimes a bigger sample size really does count because in this case, we have a number that is greater than 3.84. And so we do reject our null, which means we have a good case for linkage. So always, you know, our goal is to have lots of evidence. So you see in recombination studies, um, test crosses are often done with things like fruit flies that have massive numbers of offspring, plants that produce lots of seeds, things like that. You can use the same numbers to calculate recombination frequencies. So looking at our parental and recombinant numbers from the example before, this is our formula for recombination frequency. It's just number of recombinants divided by the total. And if you multiply that by 100%, you get what are called map units, which were actually used to map genes to a chromosome before we had uh, DNA sequencing and could like physically locate the gene on a chromosome. So pretty cool that they did this all with math. So in this case, we would have 38 divided by 100 or 38 map units. So like I was saying before, fruit flies are a great um, model organism for this genomic testing and Thomas Hunt Morgan's team was responsible for developing a lot of these principles which is why the map unit is also called a Sinta Morgan. He has a whole unit named after him and he had an enormous team of students that figured out all kinds of things and so just some of the general rules. Um, you know if we're looking at a one to one to one to one ratio that means half parental, half recombinant. That's going to mean 50 MAP units. Well, when can you get a 50% parental and a 50% recombinant ratio with all this repeated testing? That's going to come up in two cases. Either the genes are on different chromosomes or they're so very far apart on the same chromosome that crossing over is so likely to split them apart that they appear to not be linked. So that's what 50 can mean. Genes that are very close together are going to approach zero. Um, they may never get there, but it's hard to calculate exact numbers for genes that are close together. And so somewhere between zero and 50, you're going to see these recombination frequency values. So here's another problem for you to try. So we have a bunch of gene pairs. This is five genes total and their corresponding RF values. And so I want you to try and place these genes onto a chromosome. Now, things to remember, these are probabilities, so they're not a unit with a specific distance. You can't take a ruler and you know map out 42 millimeters or something to do this. And I want you to start with distant genes. So I'm going to get you started with the Y and the R being furthest apart. So take it from there. Go ahead and pause the video and try to place the rest of the genes on this chromosome. Okay, so as I tackled this first, I went for W because it was very far from R and very close to Y. Then V, because I could see that, you know, 33 and 24 as a distance from Y and V, put it somewhere in the middle, maybe a hair closer to R. And then M appeared to be between Y and R as well, but 
close to V and also closer to R than it was to Y. And so when I simplify this, I just come up with this order. Obviously, you could have from left to right. Um, it could also read from right to left. So, you know, orientation, left to right and right to left doesn't matter. But which one follows. So Y and W should be close together and so on and so forth. So that wraps up your not so brief lesson this time on linkage and chi-square and recombination frequencies.